exciting. Uh, I'm so pleased to be here. And uh, uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank the organizers of Climate Action 2016 uh, for bringing all of us together. Uh, I want to first and foremost congratulate uh, Secretary General Pan Ki-moon. And I, I, you know, he had, I think, the best year of anyone in the world last year, Sustainable Development Goals, COP21. So I, I, I want to take time now in his last year to thank him for literally putting his neck on the line. He risked his entire uh, uh, Secretary Generalship on getting this uh, climate action deal done. And I want to thank him. Uh, <laughs> I also want to thank uh, Minister Seguin Royal and the French government, uh, Laurence Tubiana is here as well. Uh, this was a whole of government approach and uh, I've never been, uh, uh, what's the right word, I have never been approached by so many French government officials before <laughs> to, to step up and meet, meet the demand. So let's, let's give a real uh, warm, warm round of thanks for uh, There were so many others. President Obama played a hugely important role. Uh, the Chancellor Angela Merkel played an extremely important role. So many uh, contributed to the success. So today we have truly unprecedented political commitment to tackling climate change. And what we need to do now, of course, is to build on uh, the commitment to, uh, to begin political action to fulfill those promises. We cannot afford to lose momentum because with each passing day, the climate challenge grows. It seems like every time we look, it's worse than we thought. Record hot days and months have now become the new norm. The Arctic is melting at a record pace. Temperatures this winter were six degrees Celsius above long-term averages. Over 90% of reefs in and around Australia's Great Barrier Reef system have succumbed to coral bleaching. We also know that climate volatility in places like the Sahel in Africa contribute to instability and fragility. The continued migration of people, whether from conflict, conflict or the lack of opportunity, is going to stretch demand for natural resources even further. Earlier this week, uh, we released a report that says that millions of people in some regions will have to adapt to living with even less water in the years ahead. The report projects that economic growth in some regions could be cut by as much as 6% because of water scarcity alone. At the same time, the cost of developing economies of too much water in the form of more frequent floods is likely to increase from around $6 billion a year to at least $1 trillion a year by 2050. It's clear also that climate change is playing a huge role in this worsening situation. It's why the World Bank's Climate Action Plan, developed soon after the Paris Agreement, will increase our support in a range of areas, from water to crowded cities and from forests to agriculture. One part of our plan, is, as, as you all know, is to help countries put a price on carbon. Uh, this will create incentives for investments in renewable energy and in energy efficiency. In many parts of the world, we've seen the price of renewables like solar and wind falling fast, so fast that they're now more than competitive with fossil fuels. Private sector investments are pouring in, but we need to expand these breakthroughs and help countries establish the right policies that will drive down the cost of renewable energy even further. Um, our, one of our great leaders, Al Gore, just told me that there was a country that, that uh, had a bid for 2.9 cents a kilowatt hour recently for solar. Um, in particular, uh, we're focusing now on coal projects in South and Southeast Asia. Vietnam is about to put 50 gigawatts of coal-powered electricity online. Uh, projections now show that a marked increase in coal consumption is going to happen over the next few decades, and just that region alone, if they go in the direction that they're now planning, could put us well beyond uh, uh, any chance to achieve the target of two degrees Celsius. So we're working with countries aggressively right now to create the right conditions to attract the kind of private uh, investments that will drive down uh, the cost of renewable energy. It's going to require partnerships. We're going to have to work in both the public and private sector. We're going to have to be extremely creative about how we use the few uh, uh, grant-based dollars that we have available. Our position is that leverage is the only way that we're going to be able to, to get the kinds of results uh, that we need uh, to make the impact that, uh, that we've all promised to make. 
Uh, we're also working on transport, uh, a, a key theme for this conference. We'll be outlining here at, at this conference uh, the main principles for a plan to transform the world's transport systems. We're calling it sustainable mobility for all. It means moving people and goods in an accessible, efficient, and safe way to help tackle poverty, uh, cut emissions, and increase resilience to a changing climate. You know, it's clear that a business as usual approach to transport uh, would account for up to 33% of all greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, an increase from the current 23%. By 2050, the number of vehicles on the road will have doubled to 2 billion. We need to invest in lower carbon transport systems to move freight off roads and onto rail and waterways and to help move people in a more sustainable net way. We know it can be done in the city of uh, Rio de Janeiro, a $600 million project to upgrade and green the city's rail system is funding more than 100 new energy efficient trains to improve services, cutting travel times for poor people living on the outskirts and providing them with access to jobs, schools, and healthcare. You know, uh, as I watch, uh, um, as I've watched very carefully uh, what we do, uh, um, what we have been doing after the Paris Agreement, um, I, I just, uh, I'm, I'm extremely worried right now. Uh, we really, really have no time to waste. We cannot delay. And as great as Paris was, as excited and inspired as we were by the signing on April 22nd, I think we now have to wake up from the fog of success. Political successes have to then lead quickly to action and implementation. Political agreements are critical, but we just have to recognize that they're just the beginning. We have to regain that sense of urgency that we all felt right on the eve of COP21 when we didn't know what the outcome would be. Inaction in, in specific regions, if Vietnam goes forward with 40 gigawatts of coal, if the entire region uh, implements the, 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 the coal-based plans that, that are in existence right now, I think we're finished. If that's so, if they do it, and if we don't act quickly enough, that would spell disaster for us, for our children, and for the entire planet.